Thank you all for your patience. I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Jennifer Behrens. I'm the head of reference services at the Goodson Law Library, and I am so pleased to finally welcome you all to the sixth installment of our annual alumni author event. This series began in 2012 as a celebration of both National Library Week and the law school's reunion weekend, which always seemed to happen around the same time. Our speaker this year is actually both a 2000 law school grad and a 1997 Duke undergrad, John D. Inazu, the Sally D. Danforth Professor of Law and Religion at the Washington University in St. Louis. John will be discussing his recent book, Confident Pluralism, Surviving and Thriving Through Deep Difference, published last fall by the University of Chicago Press. And if you've not yet had the chance to read it, I do recommend it, and copies, fortunately for you, are available for sale outside after the event. Before we do get started, I want to take a quick moment to thank a few people who helped make this event possible. First and foremost, the Law Library's business manager, Sue Hicks, who has given us so much assistance with the planning and logistics of this event. I'd also like to thank the students of the American Constitution Society for co-sponsoring the event and their assistance with promotion. Thanks also to the Gothic Bookshop at Duke for their assistance with the sales table, where once again, you can purchase copies <laughs> of Confident Pluralism by John Inazi. Previous events in this series were largely spearheaded by a reference librarian named Marguerite Most, who retired last year, and I'm very thankful for her inspiration as we continue this series going forward. So here with us today to introduce Johnny Nazu and to provide a few introductory remarks about confident pluralism is our own professor, Jeff Powell. Please join me in welcoming both John and Jeff. Sometime um, in the 1997-98 academic year, I was teaching Constitutional Law One, and I began to realize that one of the students um, stood out to me, not stood out in the sense that he was particularly demonstrative. Uh, he was quiet, although he was willing to talk. He seemed very thoughtful, uh, very smart. All of my students are, are, are thoughtful and smart. Uh, but there was something about him, a kind of quality of personality that I came across very strongly, and I, was, and I found myself occasionally actually thinking, now, what is it about him that seems a little bit uh, uh, unusual? Uh, well, maybe he's unusually courteous. Uh, he seems like a extremely kind person. Um, and it turns out I was right, because our author today is someone who not just in his personality is a likable, kind, and uh, courteous person, but whose thought is characterized by those virtues. One of the things that's uh, special about this book and about the ongoing intellectual project that John Anazu uh, is uh, engaged in is the way in which he is thinking uh, charitably in a world in which people are deeply polarized and deeply uncharitable towards one another when they disagree. He's thinking uh, in a way that accepts disagreement in a world that claims to prize diversity uh, but often seems to understand that to be uh, a state of... Um, of uh, dislike for those with whom one is, from whom one is diverse. Uh, and he's, he's someone whose very writing style uh, shows a kind of courtesy towards thought uh, of those with whom he disagrees. Uh, what I didn't know about this student, I, I, I sort of pegged him right in terms of his personality. What I didn't know is that he was going to bring these personal virtues uh, into his work as a scholar. Uh, and another thing I didn't realize uh, at all was that uh, he's a person of great intellectual courage because one of the, um, one of the unwritten rules of, uh, of American academic life is that it's fine to say splashy and big things so long as you don't actually challenge underlying assumptions. John Anazu constantly challenges underlying assumptions. You can't fit him into the nice block you want to fit him into. Is he a liberal? Well, no. Is he conservative? Well, no. Is he on the left? Well, no. Is he on the right? No, not there either. He refuses to fit in. He refuses to fit into pigeonholing, to stereotyping about his thinking, uh, and he invites us to do the same. Not 
not to surrender our own deep commitments. One of the important lessons of confident pluralism is that John is not trying to paper over disagreement or ask people to set their disagreements to one side. He's attempting to explain to us how it is possible to have deep principled disagreement and to be in community, and indeed to be in a community that is partly constituted by the fact that it consists of people who deeply and in principle disagree. Uh, it's a very exciting project. Uh, it's one that I commend to you. Uh, and there's, there's another way in which my, my partial recognition in that long off, you're getting old, John, it's a long time ago. Um, <laughs> that long off Con Law One class, um, there's another sense in which I was um, right and yet I didn't see the full truth of what I was seeing. Uh, John is attempting to show us the deep connections between matters like the personal virtues of tolerance humility and patience, which most of us would probably identify as uh, you know, positive things about individual personality, the deep connections between these personal virtues and the way in which a pluralistic community can be a community. Um, I'm not going to try to take up more time because I want you to be able to listen to John. I do want to read you one thing from the book. He's talking about the role of speech in the world that he invites us to live in. Confident speeches, confident pluralism speech imperative is we should take steps to soften our tone and move out of our echo chambers. We should choose to avoid the hurtful insult and the conversation stopper. Living speech, even in the midst of real and painful differences, can be one of our most important bridges to one another. And once again, he's saying that not the living speech that is anodyne and that ruffles no feathers, but the living speech in which we state from principle positions with which members of our community disagree in principle. So please join me in welcoming our author, John Anazi. It's a real pleasure to be with you today. Thanks to all who made this possible, and especially the library for your sponsorship. I wrote in my first book that nobody has influenced me more as a lawyer and a scholar than Jeff Powell, and that remains true today. I'm also grateful to be back here with so many Duke uh, colleagues and friends who shepherded me along the way into the Legal Academy, and it's uh, always fun to be back at Duke for my reunion. My wife's also a Duke grad, uh, and she's from Durham, so we love coming back here. The only thing that would have made it a little sweeter is a different basketball outcome this year, but I know that I am in good company with that regret right now. Uh, I, I, have, uh, I love the library connection for a couple of reasons. I spent my first year sleeping quite a bit in the library between classes, and then when uh, later, when I was back researching for my first book, uh, got a lot of more substantive help from the library through Jennifer and others who helped me make some research connections. So before I get into the, the, the current book, I want to tell you a bit about how I got there. Uh, and I suppose it starts here at Duke Law School, you could say charitably that I was a mediocre and somewhat unimpressive law student, and I don't mean that with any sense of false humility, but as descriptive reality. Uh, I did, though, discover two passions along the way of being a law student here. One was a passion for writing that I didn't quite realize I had, and the other was a passion for the constellation of issues surrounding the First Amendment, and both of those uh, developed here first in law school and stuck with me. After four years of legal practice at the Pentagon, I found myself returning to both of those issues. And it happened initially by looking at the text of the First Amendment. I was clerking at the time, reading the text for a case, and stumbled upon the right of the people peaceably to assemble. And I thought, this is odd. I have never thought about this right in three years of law school and four years of legal practice. I haven't heard much about it. What does it mean? I also realized it was the only right in the First Amendment that is inherently relational, the only one that requires more than one person for its enactment. And so I started digging around. Surely there have been courts and scholars who weighed in on this right of assembly. And in fact, in the 40 previous years, there had been virtually nothing. And so entering graduate school and about to start a dissertation, this was a wonderful topic of unexplored research. And my first book 
was uh, an attempt to recover the significance of the right of assembly in the First Amendment. Out of that book, I spent more time thinking about the political theory and the implications for our polity of the importance of private groups that exist apart from and sometimes in tension with state and majoritarian norms, the importance of dissent to our democratic experiments, and the significance of nonverbal, we might even say non-rational forms of expression and existence. And that brings me to the topic of pluralism uh, about which I wrote my second book and which I'll be addressing today. Now, the Atlantic's Emma Green recently wrote that pluralism is a word that puts most people to sleep. And since I'd like to avoid that this afternoon, I want to try immediately to demystify the word and simplify it and talk about two different definitions of the word pluralism. The first is descriptive, the recognition of our deep differences about race, politics, sexuality, religion, and other important matters in society, and the recognition that these differences cause deep and sometimes painful divisions among us. We see this in the emerging fracture of our national politics. We also see and experience it personally when we think about our own reactions, positively or negatively, to words like conservative or progressive or Muslim or Christian or atheist. And recognizing the depths of these differences pushes against the story that we like to tell ourselves as Americans. We like to talk about being one nation indivisible and in pursuit of a more perfect union. But it turns out that much of our actual existence is characterized more by difference and disagreement than it is by unity. We lack agreement about pretty serious matters in this country, about the nature of human flourishing, about the purpose of this country, about the meaning of the common good. And these differences affect not only what we think, but how we think and how we see the world. So pluralism in the first sense is a descriptive fact about the world and our existence in it. These differences are not going away, which leave us with a practical problem in need of a political solution. Rousseau gave us one answer. He wrote, it is impossible for men to live in peace with those they think are damned. Confident pluralism insists that Rousseau was wrong, that our shared existence is not only possible but necessary. And this is the second meaning of pluralism, a political response to the reality of our differences. Instead of the elusive goal of perfect unity, confident pluralism suggests a more modest possibility of coexistence that doesn't entail illusions that our differences disappear, but it forces us to pursue a common existence in spite of those differences. The argument here takes both confidence and pluralism seriously. Confidence without pluralism misses the reality of politics. It suppresses difference, sometimes violently. And pluralism without confidence misses the reality of people. It ignores or trivializes difference for the sake of feigned unity and false agreements. Confident pluralism allows for genuine difference to coexist without suppressing or minimizing our deeply held convictions. The goal is not to settle which views are right and which are wrong, but to propose that the future of our democratic experiment requires finding a way to be steadfast in our personal convictions while also making room for others to disagree. Instead of shutting down or avoiding those with whom we disagree, confident pluralism suggests that we allow space for meaningful difference and with it, the opportunity for mutual persuasion. There's both a legal and a personal dimension to this argument, and the two are interrelated. The inclination to shut a certain viewpoint or a certain, certain kind of person outside of society begins with personal antipathy, but ends with legal prohibition, a refusal to extend the protections of the law to one's adversaries, and ultimately an effort to turn the law against them. Our human nature and our own history make clear that despite our best intentions, we all too easily embrace these tendencies when we are the ones who grasp power. So the question is, how do we guard against these impulses? Let's begin with two aspects of the constitutional or legal dimension of the argument. I'll talk briefly about the right of association and the public forum. Both of these doctrines should exist to protect meaningful spaces for difference and dissent, 
both are deeply distorted in their present forms. So let's begin with association. The right of association is not in the text of the Constitution, but was first recognized by the Supreme Court about 50 years ago. The basic idea underlying associational autonomy is that the private groups that we form in civil society are properly free from government interference, absent an extraordinarily compelling justification. But the Supreme Court solution falls short of this aspiration. Shortly after recognizing the right of association, the, the court split it into two flavors, intimate association and expressive association. Intimate association turns out to be a legal category without any members. It reaches no groups or sets of relationships not already protected by some other fundamental right. It does no constitutional work. Expressive association also falls short. Instead of tying groups to the formation of beliefs, values, and identity, it focuses only on their outwardly expressive dimensions, hence the name expressive association. This should strike us as odd. Each of us knows from our own experiences that groups are far more than simply expressive. We find meaning and value and belonging. We learn by sharing ideas internally and experiencing with others inside of our groups, and we make bonds through informal interactions. Think about the groups that you care about in your own life and how relationships happen and ideas foster. If we focus only on outward expression, we miss the inherent connections between a group's existence, its practices, and its messages. This right of expressive association also creates an artificial distinction between so-called expressive groups and those that are purportedly non-expressive, and non-expressive groups receive zero constitutional protection. But that misses a distinction or creates an artificial distinction between expressive and non-expressive. Let me give you an example here. The Top Hatters Motorcycle Club is a motorcycle gang in California founded in the mid-20th century by two brothers. And in July of 2000, four members of the Top Hatters rode to Gilroy, California to participate in the Gilroy Garlic Festival. Does anyone know Gilroy? Anyone ever been there? It turns out it's the, the garlic capital of the world, so a garlic uh, festival is not entirely unsurprising. When the Top Hatters showed up to the festival, they were told by those administering the event that they were wearing gang colors, and they were denied admission because of their vests with skulls and uh, other, other expressions uh, of their motorcycle gang. This led to a federal lawsuit with lots of interesting implications, but for our purposes, the most important fact is that federal courts, both at the district court and appellate level, concluded that the Top Hatters was a non-expressive association. They had no right on which to base their claim. This should strike us as odd. The group, for example, has a website that lists its values and aspirations, that its goals are riding, riding and strengthening the brotherhood and the biker community, they share common musical tastes, which they also hold out to the public on their website. They host social gatherings, charitable events, and other shared endeavors. Is it meaningful or reasonable to conclude that none of these is sufficiently expressive for the top hatters? This version of expressive association weakens and obscures the protections that our Constitution envisioned for the voluntary groups of civil society. Without stronger protections for these groups, we will not have the kind of confident pluralism that meaningfully protects difference. We've already seen the real world shortcomings of this doctrine when it comes to groups like Muslim student associations, conservative Christian groups, and college fraternities. And even if you don't care about those groups, the theoretical weaknesses underlying the doctrine mean that its shortcomings will eventually reach the groups that you do care about. The second legal doctrine important to confident pluralism is the public forum. This is the constitutional protection for citizens to come together to voice their views, including their dissent, opposition, and discontent, and to do so in government-provided spaces. Public forums can be actual places like town halls or city parks, and they can also be non-physical spaces like student organization forums on public university campuses. Public forums are essential to our democratic experiment. They provide a practical mechanism for citizens to gather, express, and engage on topics of their choosing and in their own ways and on their own terms. 
the ideal of the public forum represents one of the most important aspects of a healthy democracy. It signifies a willingness to tolerate dissent, discomfort, and even at times, instability. These intuitive connections were not lost on the writers of one of my favorite television shows, Parks and Recreation. Are there other fans out there? In season two of Parks and Rec, the Municipal Parks and Rec Department from Venezuela visits the town of Pawnee, Indiana. And the delegation's leader, Raul, expresses dismay upon observing a public forum. This is outrageous. Where are the armed men who come to take away the protesters? This kind of behavior is never tolerated where I'm from. If you shout like that, they put you in jail. Right away, no trial, no nothing. Journalists, we have a special place for journalists. And we laugh a little and watch the scene in Parks and Rec, and yet we're not as far away from Raul's version in this country as we'd like to believe. The suppression of public outrage in Ferguson, Missouri, a few miles from my house, in the immediate aftermath of Michael Brown's death, including the arrest of journalists who covered the protests, is only one example of the ongoing violations of the public forum in this country. These violations reach across the political spectrum. Under current law, political protesters are relegated to physically distant and ironically named free speech zones. Labor, protector, labor picketers confront overly oppressive restrictions in public areas. Churches are prohibited from renting generally available public facilities. Occupy movement protesters in New York City parks. Anti-abortion counselors on Colorado sidewalks. And political protesters in the North Carolina Capitol have all been silenced by government officials overreaching their authority. The public forum in practice is quite unrecognizable from its ideal, and that departure should give us great pause. So these are two of the constitutional aspects of confident pluralism, both which need to be strengthened and reformed. We must insist the people we entrust to govern us honor basic constitutional principles that protect difference and dissent. The confident pluralism also depends on us and the decisions that we make apart from legal decisions. And the shortcomings of our civic practices are ours to overcome. I want to speak briefly about the aspirations that inform these civic practices, tolerance, humility, and patience. Tolerance, as I understand it, is the recognition that people are, for the most part, free to pursue their own beliefs and practices, even those that we find morally objectionable. This is no small task for mere mortals. As one philosopher has observed, the basic difficulty of tolerance is that we need it only for the intolerable. But tolerance does not require embracing all beliefs and viewpoints as good or right. Instead of an anything goes kind of tolerance, we can embrace a practical enduring for the sake of coexistence. That requires the hard work of distinguishing people from ideas. Tolerance asks that we treat people with respect. It does not mean and could not mean that we respect all ideas. Each of us here holds ideas that other people find unpersuasive, inconsistent, or crazy. And more pointedly, everyone in this room holds ideas that other people find morally reprehensible. The tolerance of confident pluralism does not impose the fiction that all ideas are equally valid or morally harmless, it does mean respecting people, aiming for fair discussion, and allowing for the space to differ about serious matters. Humility goes a step further in recognizing that others will sometimes find our beliefs and practices objectionable. We must also realize that we can't always prove why we are right and they are wrong. But differently, humility recognizes that some of our most deeply held beliefs and intuitions stem from contested premises that other people don't share. This is based on the limits of what we can prove, not on claims of what is ultimately true, so it should not be mistaken for relativism. Humility and confident pluralism more broadly must leave open the possibility of right and wrong and good and evil in ultimate <laughs> senses. And finally, patience. Patience points toward restraint, persistence, and endurance, encouraging efforts to listen, understand, and empathize. We don't have to accept or affirm as we do so. And in fact, it might turn out that patience 
leads us to a deeper realization of the error or harm of an opposing viewpoint. But we can at least assume a posture that leaves open a different possibility, that moves beyond caricature dismissals of other people before we even hear what they have to say. These aspirations of tolerance, patience, and humility can facilitate creative partnerships across difference. This doesn't necessarily mean that we will overcome ideological difference. We are unlikely to find agreement on all of the issues that divide us, but we can begin to build relational difference. We can find common ground even when we don't agree on the common good. But finding common ground begins with acknowledging the reality of our differences. Without the ability or the avenues to air real disagreement, genuine dialogue occurs less frequently and our assumptions go unchallenged. Tolerance becomes a demand for acceptance, humility is supplanted by moral certainty, and patience loses to outrage. I worry increasingly that our failure to practice genuine dialogue across real difference ultimately deprives us of the capacity to do so. Today, we also confront a crisis of authority that feels relatively new. The weakening of major institutions across politics, education, religion, and the media. The demise of truly national leaders in any of these sectors and the rise of social media have all contributed to this crisis of authority. This fracturing of authority and their related institutions poses significant obstacles to attaining what I have called in the book a modest unity, the minimal amount of consensus and sense of belonging that we, the people of this country, need in order to make confident pluralism possible. So does this leave us any room for hope in this vision? Well, some people have accused me of a kind of naive optimism in the arguments of this book. One reviewer who was otherwise fairly positive nevertheless wrote that it was, quote, doomed to immediate irrelevance. <laughs> because in his view, it lacked an audience that could comprehend and respond to it. I don't think that's right. Despite the many challenges ahead, I do remain hopeful. And one reason is that the American experiment in pluralism, for all of its failures and shortcomings, has actually worked well for much of our nation's history. This is not the first time that we have confronted deep racial tensions, divergent views of morality, religious differences, and coarse rhetoric. In many ways, the success of the American political experiment has always required finding and maintaining a modest unity against great odds. One challenge that we confront in imagining our shared future is that some people are still looking to the past. Yuval Levin's important book, The Fractured Republic, describes a deep nostalgia from both left and right that longs for a bygone era, albeit different eras for each side, in which the world just seemed to work a little better. Of course, many people in this country are not interested in any kind of retrieval project. Going back to the 1950s is not a great bargain for African Americans. Going back to the 1940s is not a win for Japanese Americans like my father and grandparents interned during World War II. Going back to the good old days is not a good bet if your race, gender, religion, or sexuality placed you outside of the political consensus that ruled those times. And this tension between those who long for the past and those who have happily transcended it is one of the inherent tensions and pressures of a pluralistic society. The more we recognize the actual differences among us, the less consensus and coherence we are able to assume. But this diversity of groups and ideas and beliefs also comes with an upside. It offers the possibility of better and more creative solutions from working across difference and of navigating the challenges of pluralism without succumbing to despair. This is, in the end, I think, a relatively modest vision, but an important one. Confident pluralism does not give us the American dream, but it may help avoid the American nightmare. And that is a possibility for which we should not lose hope. Thank you again for the invitation to join you, and I look forward to the questions that follow. John, I'd like to um, ask a simple question, if I may. Uh, I love the, well, 
I wouldn't describe it as uh, naive optimism, but the, the, there's a kind of serenity about uh, the uh, about your book, which I find very attractive myself. But it needs to be operationalized, or it does risk being just optimism. What uh, everybody in this room, or most everybody in this room, is in some sense connected either to legal education or the legal profession. Uh, what is it that you think confident pluralism has to say to lawyers and legal education specifically? I, I think, I mean, in some ways, the university more broadly, but law, legal education in particular, if we can't figure it out here where we have the luxury of time and we're surrounded with, in the ideal sense, arguments and questions and classes and readings that push us to these questions about difference, if we can't do it here, then where are we going to do it, right? And, and also, if we can't, in some ways, if we can't recognize law, however imperfect as it is, as much better to the alternatives, uh, then we, we turn to much bleaker alternatives. Uh, your question, Jeff, reminds me, I was on a panel in New York City last fall with Nick Kristoff, a New York Times columnist, and Tim Keller, who's a pastor uh, in New York City. And at the end of the panel, the question we were all asked is, talk about your profession and your sphere, and how does it help or hinder pluralism. So I went first, and I talked about the law and some of the challenges I saw in the law, but also some of the aspirations of the law. And then Christoph and Keller went and said, yeah, the media is, has all kinds of struggles, and the churches have all kinds of struggles. And so by the end of their talk, I said, well, the law is starting to look really good here, right? The law is, <laughs> has a, a big upside in this conversation. But I do think, as lawyers, in the luxury of both the training we get and the access to certain conversations in society that we have that it is incumbent upon us to model this for other people and to model the modeling in the classroom. And, and I think, again, if we don't do it here, <laughs> where are we going to do it? Virtues in people is that is it completely an individualized thing that you just have to have you just have to keep preaching it and hope people just pick it up or is it actually a process through yeah. which we can you know inculcate this? That's a great question. I um, if you if you listened carefully, you noted that I punted on the word virtues. I actually humility, tolerance, and patience. I did not call virtues. I called them aspirations. Uh, in the first instance, the first draft, I was talking about virtues, and then I realized for reasons owing to the philosopher Alistair McIntyre, I understand virtues as requiring habituated practices rooted in institutions. And I'm not sure we have those institutions today. And so aspirations is a much easier word because you can always aspire to something. But aspirations are going to need to turn into habits and practices at some point, or this will be a very short-lived, perhaps not immediately irrelevant, but shortly irrelevant vision. And so we need those institutions desperately. And as we look around, we have to ask, where are those institutions today? Uh, in the best cases, I see them mostly at the local level. And part of that is we are forced to be face to face with real people. And in the worst cases, our social media practices and habits push us, I think, exactly in the opposite direction. catalysts for that that are not very violent. And what I have in mind is another of, of our colleagues who's now retired used to say things had to get a lot worse better because people could tolerate a lot of pain without ha acquiring the will to change. Can you right. think of examples where we might sort of look for <coughs> pointers now that would develop this? Uh, you know, it's, it is interesting because on the local level especially, it is the shared experience often of tragedy that brings people together. And so when, you know, when Louisiana gets floods, people stop talking about their differences and just are putting out the sandbags and building the houses. And, and I think at its best, we respond to challenges, including tragedies, by recognizing this common and shared humanity. But in, in an even be better sense, we could maybe figure out how to do that without tragedy and massive suffering, right, which would be the preferred alternative. And uh, I, don't, I am, I, this is an important question that I wonder about often. What fills the gap? What is, it, what is the glue that holds the us together? So I mentioned a modest unity, which could be very modest, but it has to be something, right? It can't be reduced to the American flag and football and 
uh, responding to disasters, right? It can't be the military that we all, or it, so what is it that holds us together? That's a question we've got, have to answer and keep answering over and over again. I do think, though, there's something to this reminder in the sense that we're all just people at the end of the day. And I remember, I was in the Pentagon on 9-11, and remember in the immediate months following, there was far less of a sense of hierarchy and difference and offices fighting each other and just a reminder that we're people trying to like make it through the day. And so uh, if we could do more of that in the ordinary times, we would be better for it. Yep. Of um, organizations or groups that you wouldn't think would have common ground kind of coming together for a common purpose? Oh, there are great examples out there. And this is, so the question is, what are examples of groups or stories of people coming across difference for, to find common ground? And the problem is we don't tend to highlight these examples because we like to read about the fracture and the, and the disarray and, and the hate. But, uh, but it turns out that there are lots of these examples. And so I think part of our role collectively is to highlight more of these. So just a couple, uh, Jim Daly, who's the founder of, or the current president of Focus on the Family, which some of you remember from the 90s, uh, and uh, uh, partnered with the head of the Gill Foundation, which is a gay rights uh, foundation in, I believe, Denver, Colorado. And Jim went to Ted Trempa, the president of the foundation, and said, you know what, you and I disagree on a lot of pretty significant issues, and we're not going to find the agreement about those. But we, we probably agree that Colorado has a massive challenge right now with underage sex trafficking that's affecting lots of people in the state because of the corridors and pipelines. So how about we get our constituencies together and lobby the Colorado legislature for anti-sex trafficking legislation? And so they did, and the legislation passed, and in the process they became friends. Now, they're not the best of friends, and they retain their very deep differences, but they came together to find common ground across those differences. And I actually think that in the quieter moment of politics, there are other political examples of this as well. They're often not highlighted amidst the fracture, but there are people who are trying to work at all levels of government in friendship for common ground purposes. Uh, and, and I think, I mean, we all experience this kind of intuitively, don't we? When, when you get to know somebody who you think you're gonna just totally hate or not get along with, but when you actually are uh, working toward a shared endeavor. Most, not all the time, right? Some people are just hard, but most of the time you actually find out that you have something in common in that enterprise. Yep. So you mentioned the importance of separating um, people from ideas. How do you see that working in the context of like popular media, journalism, academia, even where we have this individuals where there's sort of this cult of personality built around them that is really inextricably, inextricably linked to their ideas? Yeah. <laughs> so I think my I think my answer is that almost all the time, I, I'm not going to say all the time, almost all the time we can learn something, a little something from everyone. And so even the even the personas and the people out there we we think we detest the most if we can approach them and ask what what is um what is it about you that I can learn from? Or what about our mutually shared existence on this earth can I benefit from? Now that's gonna, at the limit, that's gonna be really, really hard, I agree. And, and I, as I, if I were asking that question, I would have certain people in mind and think I just can't, right, I just can't. But, but, but are there ways to be engaged charitably with other people? And to, um, well, actually my friend Guy Charles, who teaches here and who's not here today, but, uh, we, we were t discussing a very controversial and highly uh, emotional racial incident that happened a couple of years ago at the University of Oklahoma. And Guy said, you know, if in the first instance we just recognized that these were, everyone in this incident was someone's kid, right? And if we looked at them first as <coughs> rooted in relationships and uh, for all of their challenges and all of their evils and problems that they're someone's kid. Uh, that was, it was a really eye-opening kind of first instance about that. Now that doesn't get us all the way. And social media and the persona problem exacerbates all of this, which is one more reason that we've got to figure out a way to change our practices there. Yep. I'll say something positive. Everyone in this room probably has someone in their family who voted for Trump 
and someone who voted for Hillary. How about starting at the very, very most grassroots level of within your own family, <coughs> talking to your uncle or cousin or whoever it is, on a very friendly basis, and try to see what they are talking about. I, I like the intuition. In my experience, family can sometimes be the hardest. <laughs> so, so I might actually counsel to start with a stranger <laughs> and work up to family. Um, but, but uh, you know, the, 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 there, there's something to the shared relationship. And there's something about family that maybe crosses the line where it's almost so intimate that so much is at stake that it raises the stakes. Uh, I do think, you know, with a stranger, that shouldn't be the opening question, right? Maybe start with what's your name and you know, <laughs> what do you like to do or what's your favorite movie? Uh, there, I went in my classes I, or in, in reading groups, I'll, we'll always start with icebreaker questions and there's a reason for that, right? We want to first get to know each other a little bit as human beings before we dive into the controversial text and, and so how do we do more of that? And then ultimately, I think you're right. I mean, it would be great if we could talk uh, candidly and compassionately to our family members, especially over political divides. But I think the, <laughs> the proverbial Thanksgiving dinner table is going to remain hard for many people. <laughs> yep. To what extent, you know, you mentioned the, the importance of this right to gather, it, the communal aspect. Uh, you're also referencing virtue ethics. But Within the American context, there's this interesting resistance to the idea of community sometimes, the sort of rugged individualism. I've done this well by myself. In what ways does that provide a challenge to, one, just understanding any sort of communal gathering, as well as to how this can play out constructively? I think in two ways. So one, legally, I think the the focus on individual rights, particularly in the Bill of Rights, has a lot of upsides to it. But one of the downsides is it has caused us, I think, to undervalue the communal and relational nature of some rights, including, like I mentioned earlier, the right of assembly. And when we focus on legal questions and constitutional issues through the lens only of individualism, we miss out on not only the doctrines that ought to be there, but some of the underlying values. And we start to see the law and then see ourselves through those lenses. So I think there's a, an important reform effort needed in how we see the law. And then the other question that, that I think of when you ask about the push toward individualism is, and maybe away from the community, it goes back to the very important and I still think unanswered question of what holds us together. So if at the end of the day, the best story we can tell is we're all a bunch of individuals free to pursue our own interests, that's not a very good story, and it's not a very sustaining story. So we have, there has to be something there that pushes us toward some greater collective sense of purpose and being, and, uh, and there are a lot of bad possibilities and candidates for that, and so we need to work hard to figure out what the good ones are. <coughs> you, you mentioned the, the reviewer that doomed you to irrelevance. Uh, how, how, how has the reception been, uh, particularly with people who don't immediately think like you do? Have you had any encouragement, any encouraging interaction? Yeah, some really encouraging interactions. Uh, I, I came to know in the past year the former uh, CEO of NPR, a guy named Ken Stern, and we agree on some things and we disagree on a lot of things. Uh, but we, we, in our first conversation, we're just trying to feel each other out. But, but in talking and, and him reading my book and my spending time with him, we actually discovered a lot of common ground. And he very graciously uh, wrote about this book and his views of it. And my sense is, if I, if I were to generalize, people who have taken the time to read the book have actually responded with, with a, a recognition that there's something in it for them and there's something in it that unsettles them, almost invariably, and I did that deliberately. I don't think anyone should read this book and come away feeling completely uh, validated or vindicated, mm -hmm. um, but, but that there's uh, a sense in which this might be possible. Now, there have been a couple people who either haven't read or haven't read carefully, and the results of that have become clear in some of what they've written, but that's been a minority of voices, and I haven't been too... Uh, upset by what I've seen there. And if, if nothing else, it's given me an opportunity to respond back and say, you know, 
if you were to read this a little more carefully, or if you were to focus on this particular argument, you would see it's actually not uh, ideologically driven in one particular direction, but it's trying to argue for broader principles. Yeah. Uh, I was trying to understand what might be beyond the pale, right, that, that we're not tolerant of practices and so forth. And I was thinking of the book, I believe it's called Infidel, which is written by a Muslim woman who um, went to the Netherlands, which is, was at that time very tolerant of different practices and so forth. And um, her argument is that setting up separate Muslim schools, which allowed then for the, pra you know, so the, the state said, well, we should respect your practices. And she talked about how bad that was for the, the female students, right? And uh, was, was very convincing in that respect. So let's just assume those facts, that there would be things which would be damaging to individuals, and we can all think about what those might be. How is it that we, um, because the whole idea was we, we want a pluralistic, respectful society, but there have to be some limits. That's, that's really the point. That, right, that right, example sure. is driving towards. And I wondered what, how we think about what those limits would be. I think her argument was that you can't hurt children and limit them in certain ways, right? Um, so that they drop out of school when they're 13 and they have to get married and they, you know. Um, and I, I just don't know how to think about that because obviously you've said we might very much respect and like people who are extremely genuine in their beliefs and very honorable people, but we think certain conclusions are not only wrong but would be harmful to individuals. So can you help me with that? Well, so the, fir the first way to respond is to underscore a premise of your question, which is that every society is going to impose limits. There's no such thing Absolutely. as a fully pluralistic society. So we are not going <laughs> yes. to have the cult of child sacrifice, and we are not right. going to have the Durham chapter of Al-Qaeda. Mm -hmm. And right, we all decided that, and that's, that is beyond the pale. And, and short of that, I think my intuition is usually to say, let's be very, very careful about what other groups or practices we put beyond the pale. And let's have a, a strongly and clearly articulated justification for why we might do so. And that is going to mean we tolerate a lot of harms mm -hmm. and risks and dangers. Uh, now, on the specific question of the internal norms of groups, there's a, there's a vast literature in political theory about how much we allow groups to set their own internal norms and the extent to which exit rights are available, particularly with children. Uh, and those are questions we need to pay quite a bit of attention to. But I think actually at this point in our country's political discourse, it seems that we're too quick to want to push certain groups outside of the bounds. And what's odd about that from a First Amendment perspective is that the rest of the First Amendment cuts the other way. So with the free speech right, for example, we we have opinion after opinion that talks about how we tolerate speech, even the speech we hate, even the emotionally damaging and psychologically damaging speech for these greater values that we've adopted. We, the people of this country, the Supreme Court, and our understanding of the First Amendment. But increasingly, once it moves beyond mere words to something else, and actually today, right, in many college campus settings, even words themselves are being pushed back upon. And so we have to have, I think, a reminder of the importance of allowing the discourse and the coexistence that is going to cause harm. And we should be honest about those harms. They're real. And we shouldn't uh, diminish or mitigate the felt nature of those harms, but we tolerate them as much as we can, which is what the best, in my view, the best view of our civil liberties and our constitutional history suggests to us. I'll just let's say again in closing, thanks so much for being here uh, on this sunny, rainy day. <laughs> and uh, thanks to Jennifer and the library for hosting me. And it's great to be back at Duke. Go Duke next year. Yeah.